כמו שהזכיר הרב פרופסור שפרבר, החלום על יצירתם של חיים, ושחלומם היה תמיד בגדר משלת לב של האנושות, שלא הייתה ממומשת. אגדות ומיתוסים שמצאו את ביטוים בספרות, בקולנוע, בתקשורת, העצימו את הצגת המציאות כבלתי אפשרית, שרק יחידי סגולה יכולים לה. במהלך המאה ה-20 הצליחה האנושות להוכיח לעצמה שהיא יכולה לעשות הרבה דברים בלתי אפשריים, לטוב ולמוטב. ואחד מהם הוא הנושא שאנחנו נעסוק בו היום, הביולוגיה הסינתטית. האפשרות אה, לבריאתם של אורגניזם חיים על בסיס רכיבים סינתטיים נראית, נראית כבר אה, כנראה באופק ואולי אף קרוב מכך. אנחנו אה, שמחים אה, ומתכבדים מאוד להזמין את אה, פרופסור אה, יעקובסון מאוניברסיטת MIT לשאת דברים בעניין. תודה רבה, תודה לכולם, ראש ישיבה, לנשיא, תודה. אני מדבר באנגלית, עוד דקה, אבל אני רק אומר... אני אוהב את המילה ניצוצות, השם ניצוצות הרבה יש היתר אחד להיות חוץ לארץ וזה לקבל את ניצוץ הקדושה ולהביא אותם לארץ, אז תודה לכם. זה גדול להיות פה בבר אילן, באוניברסיטה. I come from uh, MIT, which uh, many of you have heard of, and at MIT we have uh, many answers to many things, but there's one thing that we can't get an answer to, which is maybe uh, the most important topics, which are the answers of how halakha and science uh, come together. And for that we have to come to uh, Bar Ilan, and we have to come to uh, the Kolel at Bar Ilan, and so thank you to all of you for uh, giving me that opportunity. Um, what I'd like to do today is talk to you about a topic uh, which is a very uh, hot topic, a very uh, rapidly growing topic um, in the United States and I think worldwide. It's a topic that's called synthetic biology. We have at MIT uh, a new department uh, in synthetic biology and you see across uh, the United States uh, a whole uh, transformation of universities setting up uh, new departments in uh, the area of uh, synthetic biology. Why is it uh, such an um, exciting area, and uh, what are the big transformations uh, that are going to come about? I think the real reason uh, behind uh, the excitement and the energy behind the field is that synthetic biology offers us as engineers, as biochemists, physicists, the ability to do something that we've never been able to do before something that we are unable to do with uh, computer chips uh, or uh, mechanical engineering, and that is to be able to make things that start to become living entities. Uh, the idea is uh, presented in this picture. Imagine that you have a machine. You type in a large uh, number of nucleotide bases, a sequence of nucleotide bases that code uh, for the genome of an organism press a button and sometime later have a living organism that's self-replicating uh, emerge from uh, what you've just typed in. That is the prospect of, of what we're talking about. And what I'd like to do today is to lay out how uh, that, how we think that's, that's going to happen, what the time scales are, what the different uh, applications are. So it's really three areas that, uh, that our lab and other labs are, are focused on. I think many people here are familiar with genetic engineering. Genetic engineering was developed almost uh, 30 years ago. And the real uh, emphasis of genetic engineering is really to take an existing cell, say a bacteria or a yeast, and insert a single gene. Maybe that's a gene for uh, a protein, for a human growth hormone some other therapeutic, but basically it's taking a, uh, back, a, an existing bacteria, putting one gene into it, and getting that bacteria to now make something new, a protein, let's say. The total change to, to a genome in that case is about 0.1% of the genome. 
When we talk about synthetic biology, we're really talking about the next order of magnitude or several orders of magnitude. First area, as I mentioned, goes under this name of synthetic biology. And the idea here is not to insert a single gene that codes for a single protein, but to insert uh, a, a larger number of genes that code for a metabolic or a genetic circuit. What we mean by that is a set of genes that can work together as an electrical circuit does so that they can be programmed uh, to do a whole range of tasks. And I'll show you some of those tasks, but some of them are creating things like chemical factories, uh, creating organisms that can take in uh, wheat or uh, corn and create uh, biofuels, uh, or creating organisms that can start to live within us and measure various things about us and send out signals or messages about uh, data that it records inside of us. Really like a small computer that we start to have uh, the ability to, to program. And here we're talking about uh, going to the next order of magnitude, really changing about 1% of, uh, of a genome. The next level up from that is what we call, uh, what we've called in our lab and, and other people are starting to call whole genome engineering. And that's where we're starting to make uh, not a single change as we do in genetic engineering, uh, but on the order of 10,000 separate changes all around the genome. What are some of the things that are possible? Well, one of the most profound things that's possible and one of the most striking things about biology is that every organism that we've discovered has exactly the same genetic code. If one has the ability to make on the order of about 10,000 changes, and I'll, I'll show you how this works in a second, for the first time we have the ability to uh, change the genetic code, to make an organism that has a completely different genetic code than has ever existed before. And I'll tell you very briefly about some of the applications for that. And then finally, the last entry, and the most profound entry, perhaps, is whole genome synthesis. This is starting from scratch, starting from chemicals, and creating a long enough piece of DNA, about one million bases in length, that is sufficient to code for an entire organism, and then somehow to make that piece of DNA become alive and self-replicate. So that's kind of the, the three orders of magnitude. In order to make these changes come about, we really need a revolution in the way that we build biology, we build DNA. This is a picture many people remember. The president uh, mentioned uh, Bardeen. This is one of his creations, the first transistor. And for a number of years after the creation of the transistor, the way that people made circuits, logic, computers, was to take individual transistors and wire them up. And that limited the complexity, the number of transistors that you could do. Maybe a few thousand transistors was as complex as people could make. The breakthrough in being able to get to the complexities that we have today in chips of being able to make microprocessors that have a billion or a few billion transistors is to create a technology that is, has a property of what we call Moore's Law, meaning that every period of time, the number of transistors becomes exponentially larger. When you're just wiring things up by hand, that's linear. You never get more complex the number of people you can have wired things. If you have a technology like photolithography that every year can get smaller by a factor of two and factor of two, then the number of transistors that you get grows exponentially by factors of two every 18 months or so. And so what is missing or has been missing from biology is that we're really building biology or we have been building biology the way that we used to build electronics by wiring things up <coughs> by hand. So what's the future for biology? The future for biology is something that we call a biofab. And this is, this is something that we've been working on and, and other people have been working on. That's really to apply some of the same technologies that we use from semiconductor, but instead of patterning silicon, now we're going to pattern biology. And so we have a technology that is <clears throat> based on uh, lithography, but it's a little bit different because in this case, instead of having the photons 
uh, land on a surface and develop a photoresist that we would do for uh, semiconductors. In this case, where the photon lands, it changes a chemical property of a nucleotide base to either have a protection group or not have a protection group. And so wherever a photon hits, it deprotects that local nucleotide and allows us to add the next nucleotide. And by doing this, we can really go from building things that are a hundred or a few hundred nucleotides in length to building millions of little pieces of DNA, enough DNA on a single chip. By the way, these chips cost now about $400. We can build enough DNA on this chip to code to build all the DNA for an entire organism. So the next step is that we need to start to put these pieces of DNA together and uh, to create things that are long enough. So now we have enough little pieces that are uh, comprise all the different pieces we need for an entire genome, but now we need to put them together into a single <coughs> long piece that can become a, a full genome. And this is a whole another area. I'm not going to go into all the details of it. There are many issues that are involved because all of the small pieces of DNA have errors in them and we need a way to create a single long piece that has no errors and so in our laboratory and working with other people we've developed such a technique what we call error correcting synthesis that allows us in little devices like this these are little microfluidic chips that allow us to put pieces of DNA that come from the DNA chip into these and uh, assemble them automatically into long, perfect pieces of, of DNA. What are, uh, what are the things that we can, what are the, what are the things that we can start to build uh, with this? And why is, why is biology really uh, so exciting and so profound? So I, I just want to very quickly give a little taste for this. Um, Many people don't realize that biology really can be programmed in the way that we can program a computer chip. The very first thing when you're building a new computer chip to test out the factory that builds the computer chip is to build a simple circuit called a ring oscillator. A ring oscillator is a couple of transistors where the output of one goes to the input of the next and so forth. And the very last one is fed back to the first one. And so what happens in such a circuit is you get a sine wave that that circuit oscillates. It's called a ring oscillator. Biology, we can build exactly the same kinds of circuits. In fact, we say that the logic within biology is universal, meaning we can create anything that we can create out of silicon, we can create from biological parts. This is, in fact, such a ring oscillator. It looks exactly like three transistors. This transistor, this gene, creates a protein which turns this one off. This one creates a gene which turns this one off, and this gene creates a protein which turns this one off. And so you just start this in an abundant state of this TET protein. It create, you have a lot of TET protein, it turns this one off, which allows this one to be on. If he's on, he creates enough protein to turn him off. Now he's off, that allows him to be on, and so forth. And if you uh, tie this to a, uh, another protein which glows green, when one of these is on, let's say this one, and you look at this with a camera, you'll see exactly the same kind of behavior that you have from the electronic circuit, meaning a sine wave. The only difference is that in the normal electronic circuit, the sine wave is constant like this. But here, inside this bacteria, the sine wave is growing. The sine wave is getting bigger and bigger. Why is it getting bigger and bigger? Because biology does something that circuits don't do. They replicate. And the amazing thing is that even though I only created this circuit once in this first bacteria, when this bacteria divides and creates a second one, it also creates a copy of that circuit. And it creates, a, uh, it creates that circuit in the same phase. And so now the sine wave gets a little bigger. And then those two divide and they create an X, a, a, the next uh, <coughs> multiple of those circuits. And so I only have to create that circuit once, and that's the profoundness of biology that I have no, no other discipline of engineering, this ability to self-replicate and to grow. We can create very complex circuits. I'm not going to go into all the details of it. We can do other profound things. We can cure diseases. 
Malaria is a disease that kills, uh, unfortunately, many people, a few million people a year. There's a cure for malaria. That cure comes from a tree called a Chinese wormwood tree, and it creates a very small molecule called artemisinin. We can clone that, that pathway out from artemisinin from, from the wormwood tree and put it into a, a bacteria and try to create this small molecule which, which cures uh, malaria. The problem is that even though I told you the genetic code is the same in all the organisms, the dialect is a little bit different. And so when I clone out that pathway and put it into a bacteria, it's not quite correct. The concentrations of the different proteins aren't correct. And so what I'm forced to do is sequence that and then translate it into the dialect that the bacteria speaks. Unfortunately, we don't speak, we're not very good translators. We don't know how to do that exactly. And so what we have to do is build lots of different variants of that. Right now, to do a project like this takes about five years and about 50 postdocs to do a project like this. When we start to bring this biofab online, we'll be able to do projects like this, the first synthetic biology engineering projects. We'll be able to do them in a, in a, in a few months. I'm, I'm going to, uh, you have to give me a timing so I don't, uh, uh, this is, this is maybe the most uh, aggressive uh, project in uh, synthetic biology. This is a very large program in the United States uh, that's funded by the National Science Foundation called SINBERG. And the idea is that living inside of all of us are little bacteria. They live in our mouth. They give us cavities. That's why we have to brush our teeth. Uh, and they live inside of our stomach. But we don't have any uh, interaction with them. We didn't, uh, we didn't put them there. We didn't uh, do anything to make them more useful to us. So the idea is uh, if we could reprogram these bacteria so that instead of just being a, a bacteria that has no particular benefit to us, what if we could put a little sensor onto this bacteria, a little receptor that is a receptor for a cancer marker? a cancer protein, for instance. And so that these bacteria would live inside of us, and when it sees a cancer marker, it might signal us in some way. It may make a, uh, a fluorescent protein, for instance, which will come out in our urine, and it's an indicator, a very early warning system, that, uh, that uh, we have uh, something that we should look at inside of us. So how do, we, how do we start to do this? Well, there's a extremely interesting collection of different parts. Where do you get such a sensor for a cancer marker? Well, if you go to this place, parts.mit.edu, you can find thousands, about 30,000 different parts that you can add to your own bacteria. Sensors, uh, various uh, different uh, pieces of logic. Uh, for instance, you might want a piece of logic that says only when sensor A and sensor B both detect a, a marker, only then create a dye. That would be an, uh, a logical and. So I can go to my parts list and start to take out the sequence for that part and then program that into the bacteria. This is the other big area in synthetic biology, uh, is biofuels. Uh, you may know that biofuels uh, really have a lot to uh, credit the first president of uh, Israel, Chaim Weizmann. The uh, organism that people are very excited about is an organism called Acetobutylicum. This is an organism that Chaim Weizmann discovered uh, in the early part of the 1900s. And about a billion dollars of investment is going into uh, engineering this organism to create uh, a next gen of, of biofuel called, called butanol. And again, to do that, we need to change about 10, about 1% of, of the genome in order to uh, make organisms that, that can produce this at, at a high uh, efficiency. So I want to come now to the second area, the, the next step up of changes, which is changing the genetic code. So uh, this is a project that exists. It's a collaboration between my lab at MIT and uh, a colleague of mine at Harvard uh, Medical School named George Church. And this is a uh, NSF uh, project that we have, which is called Recoli. So 
bacteria, a certain class are called E. coli, this is Re. coli. And what we mean by that is rewriting the genetic code. What do I mean by rewriting the genetic code? Well, every three nucleotide bases that I have in a genome codes for a particular amino acid. So for instance, if I have a code UUG, that codes for leucine. You can see that there are a number of things that code for leucine here. And I don't have time today to tell you why it is that there are several different things that code for leucine. But what I mean by changing the genetic code is, what if I make UA, UUG, this UUG, code not for leucine, but for some other amino acid? All of biology that we've discovered across the world not only has the same genetic code, but it also builds proteins with the same 20 or 21 amino acids. On my shelf at MIT, I have a catalog of about 2,000 non-natural amino acids, synthetically made amino acids. I might like to have an organism that can build with completely new materials. I like, might like to be able to make drugs that have a protein that uh, is built out of different kinds of amino acids, maybe fluorinated amino acids, that have completely different properties than what current biology knows how to build with. To do that, I'd like to create an organism that has a different genetic code. So uh, this is a very uh, difficult project that we, that we engage in. And we're, um, I can just give you a status update. We're close to doing this. Um, this, is, uh, this is the organism that we're, uh, that we're working on right here. It's called MG1655. It's about a four and a half megabase uh, organism, and the very first thing that we're doing is we're freeing up one of these stop codons. The, the genome has a certain sequence that tells the ribosome where to stop. So the ribosome moves across a piece of uh, mRNA and creates a, uh, a protein, and it needs to know where to stop, and to do that it's got a certain stop code. Happens to be three of those stop codes. And what we're doing is we're freeing up one of those stop codes. This TAG that you see here, if you have extremely good eyes, um, is uh, one of the stop codes. And what we're doing is everywhere in this genome that we find a TAG, we're reprogramming it to read differently, TAA, which is also a stop. That'll produce for us a genome that has one free codon that we can use for a different purpose. And there's about 326 of those changes. And we've made all of those changes now. And we're at the point where we're starting to combine uh, bacteria. Each bacteria that we've made have a different change in them. And so now what we need to do is take a bacteria A and a bacteria B, each that has one different change, and combine them together. And this is Nogea to what Rabbi Rappaport is, is going to talk about. Bacteria know how to combine genetic material. They have a process called conjugation where they can create a small protein tube like this and uh, exchange genetic material from one bacteria to another. Very similar to animals, to, to macroscopic mating, but this is done on a single cellular basis. And so you can see right away where some of the first issues start to arise is if we create a certain bacteria A, a certain bacteria B, are there any issues about combining those? Does, does, does Halakha have anything to say about that? Or no, maybe it's, maybe everything is uh, mutter. That's not the answer. Uh, okay. So, um, let me, uh, I want, I want to make sure we, uh, we save time for uh, the most important part of this day, which is the uh, logic discussion. So I just want to tell you about the, the last uh, areas of effort, which are really to create a uh, whole genome from scratch. So uh, that is also uh, a project that is well underway. Um, the smallest organism that we know of has about 500,000 bases in it. 
But a more typical organism is similar to the one that I showed you. It has about four and a half megabases, really to make an organism that can live generally uh, in, in, in general environments, uh, you need something about four million bases. Inside of us are three billion bases. Inside of a corn plant is six billion bases. You can think about for a homework problem why corn has twice as many nucleotide bases coding for corn than code for us. I can give you the answer if you want after the talk. But to make a bacteria, we need about four million bases. Right now, each base costs about 50 cents to, to make. And so that's about a $2 million project. When we start to build, bring this biofab uh, technology online, we'll be able to bring that price tag down from $2 million. $2 million means only one or two labs in the world can work on that. When the biofab starts to come down, come, come online, we'll bring that price tag down to about one cent per base. And so to build a bacteria will cost uh, on the order um, of uh, $40,000 uh, or so. And the reason that this is an important blockic issue is that we, my prediction, is that we will start to see an explosion of the number of labs and the number of individuals that are involved in these activities. Um, just as a, as a status update, this is really the, the latest result. This is work from Craig Venter. Uh, by the way, they sponsored a, before they did this, they sponsored a study amongst different religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. And they concluded that everything was uh, mutter to do because religion didn't know about uh, bacteria. It didn't know about genetic manipulations. And so religion is silent on this topic, and so everything is, is permissible to do. Of course, they didn't have somebody who had uh, studied Masefa Kilayim, and so uh, that's, uh, that's what we're here to do today. So anyways, I'm going to uh, end here, and thank you very much. Thank you.